Welcome to another episode of the Limitless Life Podcast. I am your host, Kyle Smith. And joined with me today is Barbie Kvitz. Yes, love it. Yes, I was able to pronounce it. Thank you <laughs> yeah. very much, Barbie, for uh, hopping on to the show. And uh, tell our guests a little bit about you. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I love that you, pron- <laughs> you pronounce my name correct. And yeah, I'm a women's fitness coach and I work with women to get them to build strength, muscle, confidence, and just help them heal their relationship with food. And I've been doing this for like two and a half years and I'm originally from Hungary as well. So um, was born there, moved to Canada, you know, learned English from absolute scratch. And now we, here we are with a two and a half year business. Um, and healthy. <laughs> That's exciting. Have you yeah. always been healthy? Um, no. <laughs> so I think where you say like, have you always been healthy? I've never had like any um, issues where, you know, it was like medical issues, but I definitely in the past have done things that, that weren't so health, like not healthy habits, I would say. So, you know, smoking, drinking, things like that when I was younger. Uh, we were talking about that pre-show and I thought it was a really, uh, I think identity shifting is a really important topic, yeah. not in the sense of not just how to shift your identity, but just the introduction that it is possible to shift your identity. So how, what, at what point, what do you think are some of the points where you really want to shift your identity and why did you want to do that? That's interesting to think about because when I was younger, I think my family dynamic was different, just moving from a different country, the people I was surrounded with and the age I was at, I think most people exploring, you know, if it's drinking, partying, they are exploring that. So I was really just surrounded with people who had those interests. But in terms of like what made me shift my identity, I think it was just step by step, recognizing and seeing like what was possible and opening myself up to like the gym, let's say, (laughs) you know, so when I opened myself up to the gym and I was doing those, you know, unhealthier habits, I think that's where my identity started shifting, just like starting to work out in general. My family is pretty active, like my mom, you know, she did Judah in Hungary and she was doing it professionally. My brother has always been training as well, like doing MMA or boxing. So, but I, I didn't like working out <laughs> back then. I didn't, I, yeah, I would, I would rather party. I would rather, you know, go hang out with people than take care of my health back then. That's totally fair. Uh, and a lot along with that, did you find... Did you find that the environment you were, the people that you were surrounded with was either adding to the change or taking away from the change? I I think that's a great point because I think it's both. (laughs) I think it's both. You have to go through certain things in life to, I guess, in a quote unquote, wake you up to what else is possible. Because I think if I didn't go through that, I may be in a different point in my life. I think maybe I would explore that now. I think people will always explore what the other side is. You know, if it's people will always explore, okay, what does drinking feel like? What is, you know, smoking feel like? And then they will always explore being healthy. So sometimes you notice people are super into like sports and their and their, you know, families are just so putting so much pressure on them. Then later in life they'll try the drinking part, the partying. Whereas for me, that started earlier on, which I'm so grateful for. I'm totally okay with not being the popular person in high school. I, I was told, you know, now looking back, I'm I'm so grateful for it because I think I'd rather live this life right now, now with my healthier habits and my good habits than before. And I'm really grateful that nobody pressured me to live a certain way when I was younger I was giving like a lot of flexibility and freedom when I was younger and I think that just really helped me explore 
what I want for myself, you know, instead of other people making me. But at the same time, I think too much flexibility can bring you down paths that aren't so beautiful, but it does help you evolve as a person. Totally. <clears throat> with um, with the change from, because it's a really cool di dichotomy and it really resonates with me because I went from really drinking to not drinking at all. I'm a very cold turkey person. Like I can just go done. Like, it's just simpler. I think, I think just pulling the bandaid off is the easiest way to do things or simplest, not easiest, but simplest way to do things. Um, and I'm thankful that I have a really good support group. So the people that I would like hang out with and drink with, it also helped that I was the main drinker. So when mm. I toned it down, then it wasn't really that different for everyone else. I was the only variable that changed. <clears throat> but I found that thankfully I have a supportive group of people that w are still are st w friends with me and with me because they want to be with me, not because I drink with them and stuff like that. And I find that I'm in a very unique spot because there's not very many folks that have that support where if someone is in the kind of group where it's just excess, 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 more, more, more. And then it's usually like substance, substances in whatever variety. And then there's the folks that are more in the health part, which they want more and more and more. So I guess it's the balance of the two. <clears throat> But I find that when people want to make changes, their support system, not very often, will go along with the journey. They'll actually try to pull people back <clears throat> to kind of fit their, their mold because it's easier for us to continue believing what we think about a person than it is to change our opinions of a person that we already know. So with that, with that Friggin' tangent. Are there many of the same people that you've used to spend time with that you're spending time with now? No. Yeah. Everybody in my life has changed. And I think that's where most people have a hesitation of trying different things or exploring different habits, even. Like, let's say the gym. Like, that is so simple. Let's say the gym. A lot of people will be you know, as I mentioned, like when I was younger, I was hanging out with a lot of people who enjoyed partying. So when I wanted to, you know, let's say stop smoking cigarettes, it was just like, who am I going to talk to? How am I going to fill my day? Who's going to, and I, because I would make a lot of friends by going out to have a cigarette, or I would have a lot of get togethers because, okay, let's drink together. And I think a lot of times people are afraid of like what that shift will bring, which I think really stops them from making like that change. But for me, I real like I realized I I was okay with it, and I think that's where like there was a lot 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 of power in me being okay with it because I went into like uncertainty, and I do that actually a lot where I'm not sure how this is gonna work out. And I'm un uncertain about a lot of things, but I go for it anyways. And in my experience, it has always been beneficial when I go toward this uncertainty. But I think a lot of times people are hesitant because they're so comfortable with what they know, which can be really tough because then you end up like staying in the same place, like unhappy. So there has to be this, okay, am I okay with being unhappy, but, but certain, or at what point am I going to just like, you know, have enough and make this shift, but be okay with what's to come. That was a, that's a, that is really good. Um, so with, with the folks that, cause I, I also don't mind if like, I understand that as I change, there's going to be people that are coming in and out of my yeah. life. And Alex Ramosi says something really cool where people, the people that come into your life are in your life for one of three reasons. They're in your life uh, as a lesson. Uh, they're in your life for a season 
or they're in your life for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I think understanding that the friends that we have, the people that we have in our lives, including family, so our acquaintances that we have now may not be the same forever. And I think that when we can reframe that from seeing it as a negative, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose friends to a positive, like I have the opportunity to meet more friends. I think that that's a very, uh, I think that that is a very big shift that I made when it came to shifting my identity to fit the goals that I wanted rather than just fantasizing about it. I was like, no, nah, let's actually like try buckling things down. And when I would definitely say like in the last year, when I stopped drinking, I like built up the, built up the foundation before when I was drinking, but I've really been able to flourish and express, uh, more deeper connections and relationships by being able to just bring myself to conversations rather than just, um, thinking I need to drink in order to have conversations. And I find that I recognize the benefits of it compared to the limitations I was setting for myself. And I think that that was a very important shift where I recognized, okay, this is the positive stuff. This is going to be good. Do you think, how do you find shifting an identity? Where do you think the first steps would be for someone else to shift their identity? The struggling with it. So if they want to shift their identity just to anything, because are you asking about like if they want to shift in what ways because i think there is a lot of ways you can shift it and if are they thinking of shifting their identity or are they just thinking because your identity is like what you say you are to your like how you speak to yourself and at the same time the habits that you do so i'm curious on your question because a lot of times don't think a lot of people don't think okay i'm going to shift my identity they just start you know acting start acting a different way start speaking to them a different way which then over time shifts their identity so maybe we can touch on like habits or like the way you speak to yourself can really shift shift that identity and i can definitely go into that as before like how i spoke to myself versus like now I think that would be the, you, you pretty much, you re you restated like what I was thinking very perfectly. So yeah, let's talk about what that shift, where you were, where you are now, and then that, how that came about. Yeah. So with shifting an identity, identity, I think from before, as you even mentioned, like, you know, drinking a lot and being like the, the person who's the drinker, um, you have this identity of like, the partier, the the main guy, you know, who brings the party. And that's your identity because what you do is you bring, you know, the drinks and you create that scene. So the, your energy, the the what you're doing, how you bring people together. And I think that that's why you had that identity. Whereas for me, like, you know, because I would, you know, also go party with my friends and you know I would stay up late and smoke cigarettes and you know just do those kind of habits and not working like not exercising at all you know skipping school things like that I think that was my identity because that's what I was doing and if I'm doing those habits um, you know, the way I speak to myself, if it's, you know, seeing myself in the mirror and maybe thinking I'm not good enough or maybe, you know, picking myself apart on a daily basis, like about things that I don't like about myself versus now doing different habits where I'm like, okay, I work out, I, you know, I eat healthy, I, you know, like meditate, like pray, like gratitude, things like that. That's where my identity shift happened because I changed the habit from everything that I was doing before to everything I do now. So it really just honestly started like by little by little, you would change just one thing. If it's like, you know, if, if you're always eating out, if you're, you know, drinking a lot of alcohol, then 
you're not going to be known as a healthy person. But if you do habits of a healthy person, that's where the identity shift happens. Totally. Um, so where, where did you, where did you start to get this influence? Like who are some of the people that you're inspired by? That's a great question. So I would say hundred, one of them is hundred percent of my mom. So as we talked about before, you know, the show started is that I'm originally from Hungary. So she was here way before us and she really made, you know, she, she, as I mentioned about uncertainty, you know, moving from Europe to here, that is super uncertain of, can I make this work? And I think her completely moving countries, being uncertain, but going for it anyways. And I realized like I'm the same and I didn't know where those shifts came from, but I think overall just seeing her do the things and making it work kind of like subconsciously, I do the same. <laughs> so she's definitely been a big influence in my life in terms of like, okay, how, how am I going to make this work? Go towards the uncertain and just like being super positive. She's always been like super positive, super supportive. She gives me the flexibility to explore my own interests and like never pressures me to okay, you need to do this, you need to go to school, you need to work out. It was always been like, okay, if you want to work out, if you want to go to school, you can. If you don't, you don't. So I think that really helped me. Like, it was a little bit harder sometimes. You know, you do need that structure, like somewhere meet in the middle, whereas I feel like sometimes she was too flexible. But it did help me to create my own beliefs and what I want. So that was huge. Yeah, that's a that's a that is fantastic. Uh, so with the uh, folks that may not have had the opportunity to have that flexibility and to be able mm -hmm. to adopt their own personality traits, their own characteristics, their own beliefs, maybe someone who was brought up in a much more rigid household mm -hmm. that had no other input. So I, I think without more input, there's less output and we're just recycling the same information. Mm -hmm. So there's some folks that may not believe that that is a possibility, that they can adopt their own traits, their own characteristics, their own beliefs. Where would you direct someone to start that kind of process? Same thing where I started, whereas... Yeah, I'm super lucky and grateful to have my mom as like a huge support. But at the same time, a lot of my beliefs and just the way I live my life is inspiration from people all over the world. And that's why the internet is so great. And, you know, I've been asked which era I would live in. I said this because I think the connection we can make with other people, even having this podcast with you is absolutely mind blowing and insane because you're not even in the same country, but we're still able to have this conversation. So a lot of times people need to get resourceful. Um, you're not stuck exactly. You're not stuck where you're at. You're not just stuck with the people that surround you physically. So, but you have the choice and to get resourceful more than ever. So use it to your advantage, advantage. So for me, I, you know, research a lot on obviously online, on YouTube, et cetera. And I think for those people that may not have support physically surrounding them, you need to start online <laughs> and involving yourself in communities physically as well. I think that's huge because even for me, the way I've started my business with my mentor was from online. I even coach women online. <laughs> so we have, as I said, like there's huge connection there, but at the same time, you and I met at a physical event. So that is really important to, yes, find the online, but still be there physically if you have that like human connection. Cause I think that's still really important. And that was so yeah, so to my point, like just get super resourceful, just get super creative, like research your interests and find some ways to get yourself involved because there are there are people around you 100% that think like you do. 
but you just have to like put yourself out there, which is again, comes from uncertainty. I think something that helps with uncertainty, or at least for myself, I'm just going to drop knowledge bombs like crazy. Uh, <laughs> I think, I think something that helps me with uncertainty from where I was to where I'm going and continue on going. I think I'm just in a perpetual state of uncertainty. I'm yeah. like, okay, let's go with this. Maybe this will work. Maybe not. Okay. How quick can we recover from that one? And I find that engaging in curiosity is a way to decrease the uncertainty or the fear of uncertainty, because you're coming from a perspective of, I wonder what would happen if I try this, or if I go to this event for myself, went to the event, the event that we met at, it was fairly last minute and would not change it at all because I can recognize a very good shift by being in a group of people that were like-minded that were also going in a similar direction or have been in the direction that I want to go. I, I love that. I love that. How you said that, even though, even though that we could easily have met online, it was in person. And that is, I think that is taken away a lot, but I think engaging in that curiosity and being curious about the, what could happen rather than the, what if this happens is a way to mitigate that uncertainty. 100%. And I think a lot of people go to the what if first, where it's like, oh, what bad thing could happen if I do go? But I think for me, the biggest shift and what helped me just to, you know, get to where I'm at is like, is just, sorry, can you remind me what the other thing you said? You said, what if? And the then what you if were mentioning, and what could happen? Yeah. So a lot. Yeah. So that's what I was going to touch on is a lot of times I'm like, oh, like just see what could happen. And I think I really have a, a like a positive attitude to it where I tend to, you know, look at the good side. And I think that has really been like beneficial for me just to like, oh my God, like there's so many possibilities. But I'm, you know, but like, let's just see what could happen. Like, if it doesn't work out, then that's fine. But if it does work out better than I thought, then like, that's even better. And I think, yeah, a lot of times we jump to these like conclusion of like, oh, what if this happens? Or what if that happens? And I know that could come from like, past experiences. But you're gonna keep experiencing the same thing until you shift how you thought about from before. And I think that's huge, too. Because obviously we all have failures in our life. We all have gone through things that weren't so positive. But then again, like you need those things to help you move forward. But at the same time, you can't always, you know, look back on what happened and then create your future on that because then you're just going to keep really living the same thing. And that's the same thing. If I went to this event and maybe I went to two events that weren't so good, you know, like how, how do you know the third one couldn't be like changing your life forever for the better? So you never know. And I think you just, you know, people, I recommend for people just to just be curious. Like, you know, if you were a kid again, it's like, oh, this would be cool. This would be cool. Just kind of get like kid-like, child-like and just get like your imagination flowing. And I, I love that you kind of have the idea of being like childlike and curious. Mm -hmm. And if you look at a kid, they're getting into everything because they're so curious about so many things. Mm -hmm. They're curious about the world around them. I think when we can tap into that inner childlike curiosity, we get to ex experience everything that every experience, even if it's similar to a past experience, feels like a new experience because we're approaching it with a different lens. Mm -hmm. so that way we're not so I love how you had the example of you went to two events and then you did and they were bad and maybe some people wouldn't go to the third event I know a solid chunk and I used to be one of those people where it'd be like oh it didn't work once obviously I have to like not do it ever again and then it's funny thinking about that and comparing it to your a very the very first relationship you've ever been and then you have mm -hmm. your heart broken are you going to stop dating from that point on, or are you going to just keep on going? I think that similar to how you said, it's just trying, continue trying the thing until it eventually just works in the way that you're like, yes, let's fucking go. And I think having that curiosity is 
a way to really mitigate like uh the 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 inner turmoil like that misery is like oh here we go again and i find the people that perpetuate that past pain into the present don't are just living in groundhog day like the movie groundhog day yeah. where it's just the same day every day and they're just miserable every day and i think that that's heartbreaking i find it to be very heartbreaking so going from living in misery to living a joyful life what are some non-negotiables for you where you're like i do this because it brings joy into my life outside of working out i suppose what do you like doing what's your day look like that way how do you foster curiosity oh <laughs> So how do I foster curiosity? Can you say it like in a different way? Yep. So how do you use curiosity to counter that anticipation of pain? So you're using curiosity to mitigate the uncertainty. So to decrease the uncertainty. So I think curiosity is the gateway into moving forward and progression. Mm -hmm. How do you create that? Is there things that are in your life that are consistent or habits and rituals that kind of get you in that state of mind where you are more open to those experiences? I love that. So even before when you were talking about, you know, if you have a couple of relationships and then they don't work out, like, are you just going to stop trying? So I absolutely love that because that's something that's, been huge for me ever since starting my business even with fitness for the last seven years is you know just because I had a bad workout or just because even I stopped for a week or just because you know something didn't work out I think for me the biggest shift is like never giving up and not giving myself the <laughs> the I don't allow myself to just stop if you get like a no or if you get if so, like, as I said, if something doesn't work out, I would con continuously push myself. I'm like, okay, maybe next time, maybe next time. So that has been huge. And then for, in terms of habits, there are some things that I do on a daily basis, obviously, besides working out, I, I really focus on, on living in alignment. And that has been recently, I've been able to like put into words of like what alignment feels like for me and what, yeah. And what that feels like, like that is, that is my goal of every day. That is my intention every day is to like live in an alignment because if I'm living in alignment, things just work out better for me. If it's within my business, if my clients are doing better, if it's like, I feel happier, if I make better connections, so how I would describe that is, is I do the things that make me feel good. So let's say I wake up in the morning and I understand like some people will have different schedules and what allows them to do, but this could look different for everyone, but still work. So for me, it's really, so something I value is the morning for myself. So if it's waking up slowly, taking my time, um, you know, having breakfast, like going to the gym, those are things that makes me feel aligned because it just makes me feel good. So I think when it comes to like uncertainty, like doing things uncertain, like I feel good. So I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to like put it into words, but I guess like living in alignment where things just I do the things that make me feel good. And obviously you have to do things that make you not feel good too. Like sometimes you have to go through a leg workout and it's going to be absolutely terrible. So there's that balance of like, okay, I do need to push myself to do these things that may not be beneficial, but will later pay off. And then, but then also doing things within your day that makes you feel like you. Mm -hmm. So that might be different for you than for me. Totally. And I think a lot of people live based on, what others want them to do and that creates like um no bad like you know not having those boundaries I think so when you don't have the boundaries then that's when is this alignment <laughs> the word not being aligned so I think 
when, when you're when you're feeling aligned i think it's it, it might look different for other different people but i think because it's actually funny that you mentioned that and this is actually pretty cool it's very similar similar philosophies because we haven't chatted since the event mm -hmm. and then even there there's like a bajillion so it's, it's kind of neat that we share a similar philosophy on alignment uh, i call it congruence so there's congruent mm -hmm. living and incongruent living and <clears throat> instead of saying feeling good i put it as feeling joyful or being joyful okay i do like that like better i do use the word joy <laughs> i because i think i think we describe I think too many folks describe how they feel based off of an emotional component rather than a way of being. And something that's cool is the, this is just a nerdy, nerdy thing, but this is a dichotomy of facts versus feelings. We can feel a certain way, but that's not the fact of the situation. We can be a different way than how we feel. So an example that I really like thinking of is when <clears throat> Because I've had a couple of people move out of town, but when they move out of town, I feel jo I'm joyful for them. I am being joyful for them, although I feel sad in my heart. That's perfectly said. <laughs> and I think when people, when people go with feelings, then actions based on those feelings without thinking about it in between, that's when we find <clears throat> that incongruent living or that misalignment. I, 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 and what I think is that clear clarity is what counters that misalignment because when we know where we're going or at least a variable of who we want to be, I think figuring out who we want to be and then breaking those down, we can figure out the characteristics of what that person is or who that person is. And with my clients, I like thinking of it where we come up with you version two, an anti-vision of what you don't want to happen in your life, <clears throat> excuse me, of what you don't want to happen in life. And then also who is the person it takes to get the outcome you want? Because we may not believe us to be that person, but it's only because we don't have enough evidence to prove it. Agreed. Like with what you're saying is going back to what we talked about before with aligning yourself with the habits and then the actions, and then that's who you become. So it's like, if you want to become a different person, as you said, you have to align those actions and you have to be like, okay, what are the actions of that person? And I think that's a lot I've done in my life is that like, you know, when I went to work out, I would start working out more. So then <laughs> I become a person who works out. So I really love that you said that. And yeah, you do have to find evidence to your belief. Like no matter what belief you have or what perspective you currently have, you have that because you have certain evidences of that in your life. Um, you know, like the, you know, the basic um, example of like, you know, a yellow car. Like if you're like, you know, when I got my car, I would notice all oh, everybody else having the same car. Or, you know, when I... Yeah. So when I started working out now, I noticed everyone around works out too. So that's one thing we talked about before the show as well, is that I, it's so interesting because once you shift that identity and like, you know, you have certain habits that you live by and certain beliefs you live by and you constantly like look for those evidences. Like for me, it's an in really interesting like thought. I sometimes have this would I still call it delusional? <laughs> I don't know. I, everyone around me, I feel like is works out and is fit and is, you know, has like, you know, a, their own business or like is super ambitious or they take care of their health. And because that's what I look for. And that's the people that I like get inspired by and get teachings from. So I assume everyone around me is healthy but I think that really helped me also to like become that person too. Absolutely. Something I think, uh, something I want to touch on from a thought standpoint that I want to touch on that you just said there was um, when you, when you look around what you see and what you see is driven, ambitious people that run their own business that go to the gym. Right. <laughs> 
And it's interesting because I'm sure it wasn't like that all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I like to, I like to empower people. I want people to be completely dependent on themselves. Anything external, they don't have to worry about it too much. So something I try to emphasize is that our what we perceive in our reality is a reflection of how we view ourselves. So you're going so when you were partying, I imagine you've seen a lot more partiers. Mm -hmm. Now you're in a different place. So you perceive your own actions, your own behaviors, your own characteristics. You perceive yourself differently. And as a result of that, you see the world in a much more positive light because you are in alignment. You are congruent. You are behaving in a way that is on the same level as where you want to go. And I found for myself, the most miserable I've ever been was when I was living the incongruent life where my actions were doing the opposite of my wants. That's huge <laughs> because that's what I wanted to touch on is that if you want different things in your life, you have to look for the people who have it. Cause a lot of times we will feel like we can't do something or get somewhere because other people around us haven't been able to. And I think if people around you physically aren't there, that's okay. Because as I mentioned, you have other ways of finding that inspiration or just that how to. So you want if you're in like a current place where you feel like you can't do something or can't get somewhere you need to find people who have gone there and use them as an evidence until you become you believe in yourself so even for me when especially since i started my business you know i looked up to like my coach to have that belief in me until i found that belief so i'm just looking for evidences of like other people that have achieved what I want, you know, even if it's like bodybuilding competition I did last year, like I looked at other women who got into where I was and I used them as an inspiration, um, as an evidence, like, okay, if she did it, I could do it. If she got to her business that way, I could do it. If she built this, I could do it. So that was huge. Like, you know, you need to look for evidences because if you keep looking for what you don't want, you're going to find what you don't want. So that's huge. And then can you just please remind me about the other question you had? I'm not really sure entirely myself, but <laughs> I, I was going to touch on like another thing. Go for it. Um, that's okay. Uh, something that I want to, something that I, you said that I want to emphasize because I totally totally i love this i love and i've told people this many a times that wanted to coach or wanted to sign up for coaching but they their main objection is that they didn't believe themselves to be able to do it mm -hmm. so i think uh you touched on it and i think it's a beautiful lesson and it's to borrow someone else's belief until you've built up enough of your own and i think that that was i is a very, very powerful lesson that I believe a lot of people can take immediately and implement where they just need to find someone that they believe in to believe in them. So I think it was a really, really cool lesson to go on because when we, when it's tough, it's tough to do anything. We feel like we're, um, or at, yeah, we feel like we're stuck and we're stagnant because we don't know where to start. And I think that what you're saying about finding the people that inspire you, that are have already accomplished what you want, and then just doing, just implementing little bits of their character into our own, I think it's a really cool uh, way to go about it. Because <clears throat> going back to, I think it was, I don't think it was pre-show. I think it was during this conversation. But without new input, there's no new output. And mm -hmm. we're just recycling the same information. And if we keep on recycling the same information, th then we're going to take the same actions, then we're going to get the same results. 
And I think of like the human, the human, the being as an art project. And we are the creators of that art project. Kind of like what we were talking about, like mm-hmm. creators, there is creation. There is a source. And Rick Rubin, I highly recommend this book, but it's the creative act. I mentioned it in a couple of podcasts already, but it's the creative act, a way of being. I highly recommend talking or checking that out, uh, even audiobook, because he talks about how we are all creatives. We are all artists. The medium itself doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter if it's painting, graphic design, bodybuilding, just regular exercise. Each of us is a creator of our own world and reality. And what do all good creators have in common? They are inspired from different sources. And then we are a creation. We're a a mosaic of other people's thoughts. And the thing that I believe is very, has been for myself, a very, ah, like, ah, like removal of a weight is realizing that everybody started as a blank slate and they created the person that they are, whether that's good or bad or well-intentioned or ill-intentioned the person took the characteristics and traits that they wanted to embody and embody it. And I believe not enough people understand that those we can replace traits and characteristics that are no longer serving us. Yeah. You are not, you are not stuck. Totally. So let's say, let's say you are stuck, Barbie. Let's say you are stuck. Where would you start? Where would you start to get unstuck? Define stuck. Let's say you found yourself in a moment of misalignment. You weren't sure and you felt like really overwhelmed. Like it was just something where you're just like, whoo, like it was a powerful one. And you may have experienced it before where it could be imposter syndrome. It could be not imposter syndrome. It could be just behaving in the opposite way. Like you just know it, but you just feel overwhelmed. Not sure if that cleared it up or made it worse. However, (laughs) so let's say if you were coaching a client and they were living incongruently, they were living in misalignment, where would you get them to start to get back on track? Yeah. So you're talking about, let's say if someone wants a certain thing, but they're just doing the opposite actions and then they're feeling overwhelmed just in day to day. Absolutely. Okay. So I would say like, Take a step back, take a deep breath because you're exactly where you're supposed to be. And the things you're currently going through are needing, it's needed for you to get to like that next level, quote unquote, and it is teaching you something. So, and I think when you look at it from like, this is overwhelming, stressful versus like, what is it teaching me? I think your perspective shifts. And even when I felt like I was in those situations, I would focus on ways to just break it down. And so if I'm feeling stuck, if I'm feeling like super overwhelmed, I try to simplify my life. (laughs) Um, I think a lot of times people get overwhelmed because they feel like they need to be doing something or adding to it, or they let the stress define them. And they're just stuck in this. And like the way they speak to themselves too throughout these times is so important. So. (laughs) How would you recommend someone talk to themselves in that moment? Yeah, like for me, like when I've been stuck in those situations, just feeling overwhelmed. I do my best to like, like reflect. I think taking a step back and I know a lot of people say, you know, I don't have time to like breathe. I don't have time to like sit down and relax, but that's literally when you need to. Like, I remember when maybe I was at a job I didn't like, and I was just so busy and maybe not have so much time for what I want to do. I would take like five minutes just to sit in my car and, I would like write like gratitude and just 
I think gratitude is really important, like a time of stress. I think taking five minutes out of your day and just like slowing down your breathing is really important because you cannot solve situations from a stressful standpoint and from a, a, a mindset of, how do I want to say it? Yeah, you cannot solve situations from like the same mindset that it created from. So I think... <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you're feeling stressed and then everything else is stressed in your life now you can't solve problems so you need to be in a different perspective in order for you to solve those situations and if you're feeling overwhelmed like yes take a five minute right now like sit in your car breathe like slow down your breathing say gratitude because if you're grateful for where you're at you're also your perspective is going to shift and then reflect on how you can like ask like like what I do really when I'm feeling overwhelmed like anxious I talk to myself I'm like okay why are you feeling anxious like does this really make sense to be anxious about like is this that big of a problem and I sometimes ask myself like will this matter from five years from now or will and it's still valid like what you're anxious about is still valid but I think it's a different feeling when you're like oh my god this is not really gonna matter tomorrow and I think people think they need to, everything needs to get done today, but you have so much life to live. And if you're just living in stress, like you're going to create more stress. So just focus on the things that you can and be okay with like just doing your best, but like not being perfect. Cause I think a lot of times people are like trying to be perfect, which also causes more stress. And one thing that I heard that was like insane is like a quote is like, Perfection is the lowest standard you can have for yourself, which, because you'll never reach it. <laughs> I completely agree with that. And to piggyback off of that as well, I have a, it's, it's a really neat perspective of perfectionists are just professional procrastinators. Ooh, <laughs> yeah. And I really like what you said there about, uh, was it perfectionism being the lowest standard? Yeah. Ah, oh, damn, that's freaking good. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's really good. I Because th I think uh, I also view it like there's no sense in having perfectionist outlook because perfectionism is just unrealistic expectations and standards. So mm -hmm. I like to think of it when it comes to a goal and if someone doesn't want to do it because it's not perfect, someone either needs to work harder in order to accomplish their goal or decrease their expectations. Ooh, yes. <laughs> or decrease their expectations or decrease the desire of want or the level of desire of wanting what that outcome is. And at least I find if we turn down the volume and we find like a nice like medium, then we can slowly progress. Because I think in my own brain, I think people view things as absolutes way too often. They view things that are absolutes as non-absolutes and non-absolutes as absolutes. And I think that's just from the internet bringing things so, so much quicker. It's like things happen quick. There's no rational thinking. And so when we don't get things quick, we think we're the problem when it's actually just a normal degree of progression. And perfectionism just keeps people in trouble. Like it's, it's brutal. Like there's no, there's never going to be any other time. You just get like, you just get minorly better at things that we progress in. Mm. But those minor progressions are always going to be better than no progressions or utilizing perfectionism as a procrastination tool to give us permission to not make progress. 100%. <laughs> Freaking crazy. Uh, so with your, with your clients, do you incorporate some sort of like an identity component? Do you kind of chat with them as things come up? Yeah, I, I tend to chat with them as things come up. Of course, like, you know, before we begin, we do dive deep into like what their goals are and where they see themselves. And that constant reminder of like where they want to, where they're going, you know, throughout um, their journey. I think that's really important. Um, Cause even for me, like going through my journey, I constantly remind myself like every day of like, 
this is where I'm going, but at the same time being super grateful for where I'm at. Um, so I do the same with my clients. And if there's things come up, I think that's when we talk about them and overcome them. So how have you found to be uh, for yourself, of course, uh, to be a good gratitude practice? This So, yeah. What do you find to be a good gratitude practice for yourself? Because you mentioned that you feel it. Uh, and I understand that feeling, like that joyful feeling, like it feels mm. good. But many people don't have, they go through the motions of saying three things that they're grateful for, but they don't actually feel it. So how is it that you are in touch with that feeling of gratitude? That's good to reflect on that right now because I've never asked myself that. <laughs> but I think, oof. Like what I always do is I put my hand on my heart. So I think that helps. And then I also think about it. What if you didn't have it? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if you're saying, oh, I'm so grateful for my house. And I'm just saying that right now. Like I don't really feel anything. But if I put my hand on my heart and I think about it for a second, like, oh my God, what if I was like living outside in the cold right now, minus 10 with no family? And not being able to have this conversation or the coffee beside me, but I'm able to because I'm in this house and I'm so warm. Like that just, like, I think just thinking about the details and like what it would be like not living there. And I know I, so, there's sometimes people who maybe were homeless before and they're not now. So really just thinking back to like, oh my God, like, you know, I'm living in a house. It's like warm, just like getting super detailed about it and kind of like thinking about the opposite, I think just makes you feel so great, joyful and grateful. And I think also realizing like not a lot of people have houses in the world. <laughs> like a lot of people live in like huts or a lot of people are homeless. And I think sometimes we forget that because again, like, as I mentioned before, you know, because I see everybody else being fit and ambitious, that's what my reality is. And that's why I was calling it kind of delusional because sometimes I forget people are like, you know, obese and have health problems. Um, I'm totally aware of it, obviously, because I, you know, I work with clients, but the same thing, if everybody around you is like, you know, have houses, like it's going to be a normal thing. But at the same time, you have to like realize like how grateful for you are to able to even afford it or live in a good country or just have like, that's oh, oh my god being in Mexico I realize how privileged we are here in Canada just by drinking being able to drink the tap okay obviously not the healthiest thing don't recommend drinking tap water even though I do it you know sometimes <laughs> but the fact that is I can do it in Mexico no you can't you're gonna get sick or people are like I just re like I know this is like a really big rant on how I tune into um that gratefulness but it's really also like you know just in general traveling I realize like how privileged we are because you know in different countries they're hustling for such a little money and we're have resources here but they don't have there and like the healthcare, the the just the water like the food quality the food the amount of abundance of food you can choose from is like absolutely insane I think people forget that how good we have it and then they're like, oh, I'm grateful for my house. But like, do you realize like how big that is? Like, so I think just that. I really like that. It's actually kind of crazy. There's, it's kind of like a controversial thing. Um, and thankfully, I'm not popular enough to be canceled. So this is good. But uh, I was They'll listening find your to- videos later. What, sorry? They'll find your videos later. Yeah, like... exactly. They'll be <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> it'll be 25 years from now. <laughs> yeah. It'll be awesome. Super, something to look forward to, I suppose. Uh, but the, something that 50 cent said, uh, he was on a podcast and he was just being interviewed and stuff like that. And he's someone that was dealing drugs, shitty family life, a uh, single, single parent. He got shot nine times. Yeah. Like, and he survived. And then he is now producing TV shows. He's producing music. He has his own water company. He has like all these things. So we went from something that's where he was just busting his ass surviving to a point of being able to reap the rewards of yeah. that effort. And now he is thriving. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I just wanted to give context on the contrast of where he was mm -hmm. to where he is now, <clears throat> because I think that this is a very, I think this is commonplace in Western society where we do forget about uh, the amazing things that we have available because we're thinking, I think, or at least I can speak for myself, I was very self-centered. Mm -hmm. So everything was happening to me and I was in what I like to call the cult of victimhood. So I viewed myself as a victim just because, and then I was behaving or just because other people viewed me as a victim based off of what I would say, oh my gosh, it's so so crazy that you went through this, blah, 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 blah. And I don't personally think I, my past experiences are in the past and I do not, res I don't really care about the past much. Like yesterday happened and it's okay. I like taking the good memories, but I think people take the bad memories and just use that as a crutch to give themselves <laughs> permission to not make progress. But the thing that he said after that freaking long tangent, hopefully I'm on track still, but something that he said that I thought was a very interesting thought exercise is that depression is a luxury mm. and only people that have a good life can take the time to experience depression because people that have hard lives don't experience it. So if you look at the data, North America, Europe, those are where the increases of depression is as the highest. Mm. It's also where it has the lowest crime rates. It has the highest, most people have homes, people have jobs. So even in the worst, what we perceive to be the worst here, the worst case scenario here, someone is thriving and joyful and happy somewhere else. So when he said depression is a luxury, people that work hard don't have, I was like, interesting. Because we don't have the time to, because it's, because it's not taking the time and sit in our suffering and to allow, I call it a sewer cycle where we allow that sewer cycle, where it's just those shitty kind of feels to continue, continue, continue. So when I was, when I'm really kind of going through whatever kind of mental state, I use a similar reframe where I'm like, okay, there is another person on the other side of the planet that is crushing it. That doesn't have the same resources as me. So I'm, so I think, how am I decreasing my abilities to fit my comfort when someone else out there has less resources, more resourcefulness doesn't live in a society where things are on the phones and quick access where we can get food delivered to us, skip the dishes. We don't even need to walk to get food while other people are walking miles just to get water, mm. but they're happier. That's so that yeah in in my mind it's it's the it's the contrast where i think progress is the antidote to a lot of our misery and if we're too busy making progress we don't have enough time to think of how much we suck yeah there's two things to that the one i I've, I've heard is you know, the bigger the problem, the more attention you get. So I think people get stuck in their problems because the amount of attention they get from it. And then the second thing to add on to that is like the perfectionism mindset. So if you're getting attention from your current issues, why would you change that? And then if that paired with, let's say, perfectionism and you're like, I want this to be perfect, you're never going to take those steps and you're always going to be like stuck in like, you know, um, I don't know what word to use. <laughs> you're always going to be, yeah, you're always going to be like stuck I, I in a way and you're not going to be progressing forward. Um, so I think that's why some people are stuck still and not making any progression. Yeah, if they were making progression, like I felt like a lot of my happiness and and I think a lot of times people think there is an end goal too, <laughs> which also I think causes I wouldn't say like depression but it kind of makes you feel low because I every time I set a goal and I'm like when I reach this and I reach that I'm like okay what now you still don't feel good 
So, you know, I thought if I make this much money or get this many clients or reach this with my physique or win in the show, um, that's going to make, that's going to feel different. And even though that like feeling lasts like a moment, because after that, now you're like, what's next? I think a lot of times, you know, putting that timeline or putting, oh, when I reach this, and I think that's still going to get you back to that, like, quote unquote, depression feeling. And then I think just focusing on like constant progression without expectation is so important because that's what I always tell my clients. Like, as long as you get better 1% like every day, that's all that matters. And, and I think a lot of people are stuck <laughs> because of like the procrastination, the perfection, like probably the attention from it. I would, I 100% agree with that. Something that was kind of cool for, uh, I was listening to the Andrew Huberman podcast and <clears throat> he was talking about, yeah, you like that one too? Yes. I literally been like binge watching. Oh, it's so good. Uh, but he was talking about uh, when he was kind of doing his apprenticeship. I'm not sure what it is, what it's called, but he was doing his practicum. I'll say the practicum. He was doing his practicum and the crew that they were working on, they were researching, researching, and they had some sort of a breakthrough. It was like a really good accomplishment. It was like, yes. So Huberman was really excited. And the person that was in charge said to Huberman to decrease the excitement. And I think what folks, or I'll finish this part. So to decrease the excitement, because when we have that huge increase in dopamine from that accomplishment or that feel good sense of accomplishment or just like whatever this peak is, there is the opposite and equal valley. So something he says that I think is really cool is dopamine is a limited but renewable resource where we want to decrease. The, and this is interesting because people are always like, yeah, go be the happiest person ever. I actually... And I'm a very cheerful person. I'm a very cheerful person. I'm a very joyful person. And I, it's due to me taking this advice of mitigating, decreasing the amount of excitement so that I don't feel that withdrawal afterwards because it's going to go up and it's going to go down, whether it's by a lot or a little, only depends on how much we get ourselves amped up, wired and excited about it. So even if, it's a really exciting opportunity, really exciting accomplishment. I try to decrease my degree of excitement so that I don't experience that crash. So when it comes to what you were saying before about, uh, let's say it's a show, you're training for the show, you absolutely slay it, then you have that drop afterwards. And I think when we engage in the process and we enjoy what we're doing more so than what we believe will enjoy when we accomplish it, accomplish whatever it is. I think that's a healthy uh, degree of excitement and just normal normalcy. It's like just a nice little like smooth frequency. It's not huge peaks and valleys or uh, trough, peaks and troughs kind of thing. There is something else I wanted to go with. Oh yeah, I wanted to uh, introduce a different perspective of gratitude as well. Uh, and I took this one from Alex Ramosi. It's freaking sweet. Mm -hmm. But I like that the old man frame or the grandfather frame where if I'm experiencing this present moment and if I'm like 85 years old and I'm looking back at this as a present moment, this is my first, this is a memory. Mm -hmm. So I could be thinking 85 years. Oh, I'm really glad that I started that podcast. Like I learned so much. I got to chat with Barbie. I got to chat with Kenzie. I got to chat with Coates. I got to chat with Dean. I got to chat with a bunch of people that have really positively impacted me. So now I'm grateful for that memory. So I'm experiencing the present from the lens of a memory. Mm. And that brings me gratitude because when I think back on other memories that brought me joy, it's no different. Mm, so you're saying to think about past experiences and say great gratitude to them. Yes. And then duplicating the thought 
where the, right now is a memory to our future self. So I feel lucky and inspired and excited that I get to chat and converse with really cool people. I am excited and grateful that I was able to get out of my own way and start a podcast that I've been talking about for two and a half years. I am grateful that uh, Kendra is an absolute badass partner in crime. I am grateful. So I'm thinking back on it like, wow, I remember when I was 33, going to be 33 tomorrow, my birthday. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Happy birthday, so, everyone thank in the you. comments. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So having that frame where I'm experiencing all of this for the first time and kind of like what we were talking about, childlike curiosity and just that excitement. It's it's that's been a frame to help me become much more grateful for the right now and then keeps on going and going. It kind of flows. And that's been very helpful for me. Mm, I love that. I think that's definitely a good way to look at it. Um, gratitude. That's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, you're good. Go for it. Oh, I was going to touch on like the journey because I was like the constant up and down and then just like super spike in like um, dopamine and just like, you know, by reaching something. And I think that's been huge for me. Whereas like, I've set so, like, you know, big goals for myself that like, I like, Oh, these seem scary. And then, you know, when I achieved this, I had this like super, um, like I was like high on life. And then, you know, after the next day I was in this super kind of like what now I'm like not really feeling inspired and you took me like a while to get back on track and set like another goal but like now even when I realize when I book a trip for myself or when I have an event coming up that I'm looking forward to I know I used to be this person that I'd be like I'm so excited and I'm only looking forward to that on the weekend and I know a lot of people like I'm looking forward to the weekend all the time and that brings my point is that I look forward to like every day because if I'm always looking forward to like the next thing and then I'm like oh I'll be happy on the weekend because I'll get to go out things just pass like even me being in Mexico like the last couple of weeks and then coming back but like knowing how excited I was but it already passed and it's been a week I realized how fast things come and go so it's just so overwhelming to be constantly like looking forward to something experiencing it it goes away and you're like what now and I think I took and taken a step back and being like okay let's just focus on today let's make focus on making the best of today let's see what could happen today let's like you know with curiosity that we talked about mm -hmm. and just feeling joy for today and I think that's been a huge shift for me is like looking at it like day to day instead of always looking forward to something in the future that's been a huge uh, shift for myself as well, where it's I there's only control of the day. And I always emphasize, I think people just zoom out too much and think of their life as a whole when right now is the only time that they have. They're too busy in, in they're too busy in tomorrow or they're too busy in yesterday, but they're not spending enough time in today. Exactly. <laughs> I think uh, one of my favorite quotes that I really like, it was from uh, Kung Fu Panda and gonna like get really really close to it but it was when the old turtle is talking about uh time basically and the old turtle says living in the past is depression living in the future is anxiety but the goal is to live in the present mm. or no but to live in the present is a gift or no to live in the now is a gift, and that's why it's known as the present. There we go. Oh, I like that. Yeah, I wanted to make sure I had that last part, so I corrected myself a couple <laughs> times because it is a gift. Like but the present, it is our present. It is a gift. Mm. And I think when we get to when we have that perception shift of that, where we want to utilize the day that we have more effectively, efficiently, and joyfully. I think there's a lot of positives that come away from that. 
Thank you yeah. for sharing that quote. I don't think I watched Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> oh, it's so good. I love it. It's so much fun. Uh, the sequels, not so much, but the first one was awesome. I yeah, I'll so watch good. it just for that quote. Beautiful. Yes. You're going to hear it. You're going to be like, oh, it's way better delivered in the movie. I'll tell you. Yeah, that, yeah, you know? yeah. So <laughs> Probably good. like inspiring scene, everything. Totally. So uh, Barbie, is there any any questions that I didn't ask that kind of popped up or something that you want to kind of touch on? I think you covered everything pretty well. Sick. I appreciate that a ton. So uh, we're getting to the end of the podcast. Mm -hmm. um, would you be able to share where people can find you? Yeah. So on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, it's all the same name. So it's B-A-R-B-I, Barbie. And then the last name K-V-I-S-Z. Um, so they can find me on Instagram, all those platforms, exactly the same. That's fantastic. Do you have anything coming up? Any exciting news? Any exciting news? Not right now. Sounds good. <laughs> all good. Just just living life, you know, enjoying what it is, what's going on right now. I love it. So uh, yeah, end of the podcast, got two questions for you. I told you what they were at the beginning. Going to go from there. So <clears throat> first one. Once again, set in the scene, you're on your deathbed. The people that love you are around you. You have zero content. There is no access to your content. Mm -hmm. What is one piece of advice you want to pass on? So there's absolutely nothing left of me. What would I want them to read or hear? I think it's the living in joy. I think that is the most important because I think everything stems from that. Um, when you live in joy and gratitude, everything just works out. And I think find ways to live in joy. I really that like that. That's a good one. I completely agree with that one too. Joyful living. Woo. Yeah. Oh, new I like that. Joyful living. New, yeah. new movement right there. Uh, and then the final question. So podcast called The Limitless Life. How would you define living a limitless life? So one moment. <laughs> How would I define a limitless life? So for me, it's being... able to, again going back to joy like for me I feel really limitless when I can live in joy and do the things that make me happy I think that's when I feel limitless nice I really like that well Barbie thank you very much for being on this show I appreciate it a ton for those of you that are listening on the podcast apps be sure to subscribe turn on notifications leave a five-star review let me know what your favorite takeaway is in the comments and if you're listening on youtube be sure to like subscribe turn on notifications comment below with your favorite takeaway be sure to go check out barbie follow her on the instagram the youtubes the facebooks the internet and outside of that until next time i hope your day treats you as good as you look have the